Uh, okay, there we go. So I wanted to take a moment to say, first of all, I am really impressed that you guys are here. It's the last night of classes, and it's cold out there, and you stumbled across campus to be with us, so welcome. Thank you for being here. I also wanted to just recognize we have some special guests tonight, uh, a group of high school students who have identified Stony Brook as a place where they would like to perhaps attend college are joining us down here in the front row, so let's give them a warm welcome. So if this is your first time at a My Life As event, this is the signature lecture series for the School of Journalism. This is the 49th lecture in the Stony Brook My Life As lecture series. Its purpose is to bring news literacy and journalism course lessons to life through the life experience of notable and noted journalists. And because we recognize that the vast majority of you are not journalism majors and are not going to be journalists, the other thing we try to ask our guests to speak about is how they found their way, and you heard me say this just the other night, how they found their way to a career, how they found their way to work that was not just a job, but was really sort of the defining element of their life. And so we hope there are transferable lessons if you're an engineering student or someone. I had several students come up after the last speaker and say, you know, I'm not going to be a journalist, but that was very inspiring. Uh, just some reminders. Credit is granted in the news literacy course, and I believe in some journalism courses for students who swipe their IDs on the way out. So just look for the swiper machines. Please silence your cell phones. But uh, we are live tweeting from this event. The hashtag is hashtag MLA colon Klein. And I know the nothing uh, the, after the colon shows up in the hashtag, but it helps us to sort out uh, the tweets from this event from others. Uh, ideal duration is about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, the, our guest tonight has some provocative things to say. He'll sit down with Professor Klerfeld for a conversation driven by our issues and questions. Uh, and then the third and most important part of these events is your questions. The microphones will be roving up and down the rows. Just raise your hand. We encourage your questions. We give, excuse me, to the adults. We give preference to student questions because that's, after all, why we're here. But uh, questions are welcome. We would like to hear from you. Um, so that's it. I'm Dean Miller, the director of the Center for News Literacy. Welcome. And I'd like to introduce Jim Klerfeld professor in the journalism school who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean. Good evening to all of you. And I'm also impressed with the turnout and uh, appreciate it. I also want to mention to my 340 and 390 students, you won't have to swipe, but if you just sign in and we're all finished, I have a piece of paper to show that you were here. Uh, we are extremely fortunate tonight to have a really special speaker. Joe, Joe Klein is one of the top political uh, journalists in the country. Uh, he's actually, I think, born in Queens, uh, lived in Valley Stream on Long Island, uh, worked, uh, she started out working for uh, the Ex Essex County newspapers in Massachusetts, then went to WGBH in Boston. Um, he, I don't know how many, how many of you saw the movie Primary Colors about Bill, Bill Clinton's campaign, uh, but he wrote the book, uh, Primary Colors. It was a number one bestseller for nine or ten weeks, on number one on the list, and it was by Anonymous. He didn't use his byline, uh, and that turned out to be an interesting story in and of itself that maybe we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, Joe is a very special journalist in that a lot of people who you read these days, you can almost predict what they're going to say in their columns. Uh, they can be very well written, but they're predictable. And one of the things about Joe Kine is he's never predictable. I think that's partly because he really reports what he's doing and because he has a very active uh, and questioning mind. Uh, and I'll just give you a, a couple quick examples of the type of things he, he's, he does. Uh, he writes a column now for Time Magazine every week. Um, in writing about uh, what's going on uh, in politics now, he was talking about the movie Lincoln. How many of you seen the, have seen the movie Lincoln at this point? Well, wow, it's pretty good. 
So you know it's a wonderful movie and a fascinating portrait of Lincoln. Um, and he talked about the importance of politicians being willing to wheel and deal. He said it's an, it, it's an act of civic virtue, a movie about a living, breathing, horse trading, occasionally mendacious genius of a politician. It resurrects the noble greasiness of politics and at a perfect moment. We need some inspired horse trading in Washington right now with short-term stimulus, long-term deficit reduction, health care, and issues, and other issues on the table. So there's an example of Joe really being uh, somewhat of an iconoclast, uh, but also dealing with something that we're all familiar with. He also wrote about the 212 campaign, um, and this is what he had to say at the end of one of his columns about the campaign. He said, perhaps as a gesture of good faith, the rest of us, those unthreatened by psychomagnetic polymorphic future, should listen to their more reasonable arguments, especially the ones that involve personal responsibility. He's talking about the Republicans here. Perhaps we should begin to think about ways people who receive benefits like unemployment insurance, food stamps, even disability can give back and also give back. Because citizenship is a healthy, in a healthy democracy comes with responsibilities and too many of us of all incomes haven't been responsible enough. So another example of him going maybe against the grain and surprising people, but I think that's what makes for a great columnist. But you'll see for yourself. Without any further ado, let me introduce Joe Klein. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm honored that you're all here. Um, I know you're getting credit for it. That's, that's good. Um, but, uh, you know, the last night of classes, when I was sitting out there, so, as opposed to being up here, last night of classes meant first night of cramming for the, uh, for the finals. So uh, be afraid. Be very, very afraid. <laughs> um, I want to talk uh, for a bit about, um, about me and some of the things I've learned over the last 10 years, and you. And uh, I, I'm really thrilled. Often when I show up at universities, uh, I get an audience of uh, people in the community, most of whom are your grandparents' age. It's like being in the middle of a blizzard, you see all this white hair out there. I really, I, I, I really want to talk to you guys tonight about something that's important. And I want to talk about my failed attempt to retire. Um, I have been a journalist now for 43 years. God help me, I have covered 10 presidential campaigns. I'm not going to talk about them tonight. I'm not going to talk about the fiscal cliff. Jim can ask me about it. You can ask me about it. I want to talk about something far more important. Um, after the 2000 campaign, my seventh, I retired um, as the Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. I figured I was at the peak of my profession. Um, I had done it all. I was very proud to have worked for The New Yorker, but as Jim said, I've been known to write novels, and I wanted to go home and write some more. Uh, there was also a nonfiction book about Bill, Bill Clinton that I was going to write. And uh, I started doing just that. Uh, I live now in, um, in Westchester County, just north of the city. And on September 11th, 2001, everything changed. Um, you know, looking out at you, I realized that this may be one of the earliest memories that many of you have. Uh, but it was an indelible moment for me. Uh, all of a sudden, something happened in our town. We became citizens again. All of a sudden, we heard that they needed um, uh, gloves and shovels down at Ground Zero, and people just stormed Home Depot and bought it out and driv delivered it all to the fire station. Um, and uh, we heard that, uh, you know, we nine of my neighbors didn't come home that night. Uh, and we went to the widows, the forces of social capital in town, uh, which is a euphemism for the women, um, went to the went to the widows and set up meal schedules uh, so that they wouldn't have to cook for the next few weeks. And 
Uh, then we had the memorial services, and one young widow came up to me, and she was holding a baby in her arms, and she said, Joe, you do this for a living. Um, when I got this one, I got a two-year-old. When they get old enough to ask why their father died, will you tell them? Um, now, they're not old enough yet to have asked that question, or else she's lost track of me, or forgotten that she asked me to do it in the first place. But I figured I had a mission. And for me, journalism, I mean, I'm a child of the 60s. I didn't start getting educated until they stopped doing it to me and I started doing it for myself. Uh, and journalism has been a sequential education. Um, I go from obsession to obsession to obsession. And after 9-11, I figured that the next group of obsessions had to be the military, our intelligence apparatus, the region, uh, and Islam. And so s very shortly thereafter, I accepted a job uh, to be a political columnist at Time Magazine as long as I could study those things. Um, I hadn't had much experience before that, and, but, I, but I started following it pretty closely. Early in 2006, I wrote a column about a form of military action um, that might quiet things down in Iraq. Iraq was just a mess at that point. Uh, it really looked like the bottom was going to drop out for us and for and result in total chaos. Um, and I wrote about a uh, military theory called counterinsurgency. And this was kind of counterintuitive. Um, you know, U.S. military up until that point had been based on the principle that you go after the bad guys, you kill them, and then everything's okay. Counterinsurgency, the theory was, you protect the good guys, you protect the average folks, and they'll tell you where the bad guys are. Uh, so I wrote this column, and um, the next day I got a phone call from a general named Petraeus, and I realize he has since become kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a bathroom joke. Um, but but uh, he was out at uh, Fort Leavenworth, which is a kind of graduate school for the military. And he said, he said to me, um, you're on the right track, but you don't know anything. We're out here trying to nail down what counterinsurgency warfare would look like. Do you want to come out here and study with us for a few days? And I said, absolutely. He said, there will be a reading list. Uh, and I then get a reading list of 30 scholarly articles about counterinsurgency from publications like Military Review and some Australian publication. And um, I... Uh, I'm a liberal arts guy, and as, and as I said, I'm a child of the 60s. I'm like your parents and grandparents. So I picked and chose, you know, that looks like kind of interesting. Well, that's a little bit complicated. I'm not going to read that one. Um, and I get out to Fort Leavenworth, and every night I go to the classes during the day for the, for the majors who are there and learn the basics of, uh, of military uh, uh, strategy and logistics and history. And then at night, Petraeus and a group of his, uh, his people would uh, sit down with me at a Mexican restaurant, and I'd be able to ask anything I wanted. And um, sure enough, uh, well, first of all, these were the most rigorous intellectuals I had ever met. They were also warriors, they were also train killers, they were also incredibly physically fit, which was very daunting to a fat old guy like me. Um, but the important part was they took the war in Iraq more seriously than any of the civilians I had met in the Bush administration. They were really thinking it through. And they were tough with me uh, when I would ask a question that it had occurred in the reading. At one point, I asked a question, and the guy says, Klein, didn't you read Corelli's piece about full-spectrum warfare? And um, 
And I said, no, uh, it was on the reading list. And then he said, Klein, you are so lazy. I'm, I'm amazed that you can tie your shoes in the morning. And I said, I wear loafers. And he said, <laughs> and he said, obviously. Well, I was so impressed by these people that I decided I had covered wars in the past. Um, getting a little bit of feedback here, I think, or a hum. Um, you, uh, but I'll keep on going. I don't think it's mortal yet. Um, but I really, when, once Petraeus got the job to lead the American forces, the international forces in Iraq, I, um, I said to myself, I got to go out there and see it. I got to go out and embed. And um, I told my wife, and she said, if you do get hurt over there, I will say I told you so. Um, but I went. And I found myself utterly amazed and wildly impressed by the troops. I know you hear this all the time, how great young troops who are overseas, you know, slap a, a yellow ribbon on your front door or, or on your rear fender. But I kept on going back and back and back. Um, and I went into areas in Afghanistan. I, was, I kept on going back to the same town in Afghanistan over and over again, a town that was controlled by the Taliban when I first went there, 80% controlled by the Taliban. And, uh, and I watched a young captain. He was uh, 31, 32 years old. Uh, he commanded a, a company of U.S. troops, uh, about 120 of them. And we would go out on patrol in town. And he had some money uh, to use to help the people of the town. Uh, there were also continual, you know, firefights and, um, you know, the, the traditional things they expect soldiers have to do um, that they had to do. But he also decided to find out how the people in the town wanted to have that money spent. The technical term is that they're called CERC funds. And we would go out, and this, I would go out with squads, and we'd go out and patrol, and we'd have an interpreter, and we would ask people what they wanted. And what they really wanted was that there was a school right on the borderline of the area that the Taliban controlled that had been built by the Canadians, and, they wanted, and it had been booby-trapped and closed by the, uh, by the Taliban and they wanted the Americans to reopen it so that their children could go to school again. So the next thing he had to do was to sell this to the local shura, the town council. And they're the rich guys. <coughs> Excuse me. And over there, it's all guys, by the way. Um, and they had other ideas. They owned land on the south side of town. Um, and there were irrigation ditches there, and they wanted the money spent to open uh, the, clean out the irrigation di ditches so that they could grow opium on the south side of town. So he cut a deal. He gave them some money for that, but the lion's share of the money went to open the school. Well, lives were lost opening that school. Limbs were lost. I visited, when Walter Reed was still open, people who had been severely injured. But that school is open today. And the thing that I realized was, this guy, I mean, you know, my conception of what soldiers did was, you know, they salute and charge a hill and don't do any creative thinking at all. But this guy had done incredible creative thinking to get that school open. And I thought to myself, if he could do it here, where you hear IEDs exploding every few hours and, and the occasional rattle of small arms fire, what kind of a politician would he make when he goes home to Iowa? And to me, this generation of US military um, officers and sergeants, people who had responsibility in those places, should be a major lesson to you. And I'll tell you how. Uh, because I truly believe that they are going to be the next great generation.
generation of American leaders. I'm a baby boomer. We haven't been too good at this. Our generation hasn't been very good when it comes to leadership. Um, and when I look at my parents, and when I look at these, these kids, what did my parents, who were the greatest generation, what did they do? They served and sacrificed. What are these kids who were out who were out in Iraq and Afghanistan did? They served and sacrificed. So I came home from one of these trips to Afghanistan, and I turned on the TV, and I see all these white people screaming and waving their fists. It's the Tea Party. And I said to myself, where on earth did they come from? And I realized that I'd been spending more time in the Middle East than the Middle West. So I did an old-fashioned journalistic thing, but in a newfangled way. I rented a car and drove across the country to find out what was happening. And what we did was we crowdsourced it. We announced it in the magazine. And then in subsequent years, I began doing it every year. Uh, we announced it on Morning Joe. We announced it on CNN. And we would say, look, Here's the itinerary. Here are the states I'm going to be going through. If you, want, if, you know, if you want to talk politics, put together a group of your co-workers or neighbors or whatever. Um, you know, email me and we'll set it up. On my most recent road trip last June, which went through the battleground states, Virginia, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Michigan, I did 40 of these town meetings in 20 days. And at the very first one of them, I was meeting with a group of uh, Vietnam veterans who were very conservative. They were in North Carolina. And I asked them, what do you think about Barack Obama as commander in chief? And they started to laugh. Um, I said, I think he's done, you know, he got, he got Osama bin Laden, right? Um, you know, we were decimating the leadership of Al-Qaeda. Uh, they said, ah, he's not a military guy. I, they said, we don't like Romney either. Um, I said, who was the last one you liked? And they said, George H.W. Bush, because he really served. And I said, well, look, you know, everybody really served in World War II. And a lot of people, but not all everybody, served in Vietnam. Only one and a half percent of our population is serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Where are you going to get your candidates from? And this bald, tattooed truck driver, retired truck driver, said, bring back the draft. And the rest of them at the table cheered. Well, I thought, well, yeah, they're, they're old military guys, and we're not going to bring back the draft because the military doesn't like it, and we don't need that many troops these days. But as I began to travel around the country, um, I, would, I would hear people, when I spoke to moderates and liberals, say, we can't talk to those Tea Party folks. And when I would have meetings with Tea Party folks, they would say, we can't talk to those liberals and moderates. When you look at how this translates in Washington, you see the gridlock that we have. And I, and I would ask them, how do, we, how do we start getting over this? How do we start talking to each other again? And time after time after time, without me eliciting it, they would say, we, have, we should have some kind of national service where people of different sorts get to know each other and work together. Because if you talk to the, the veterans of World War II, like um, my father and my father-in-law, they got to know people from the South. People from the South got to know Latinos and um, and, and African Americans and Northerners and Jews, everybody got together and they found that they could, they could talk. But a more important thing happened. And that was that when you serve together in a greater cause, you become a greater person. You, when you have to make the sort of decisions that these young soldiers made, then you become a better citizen when you come back home. Because you know that government is very serious business. It can send people to die. It can help people to live. And so 
I don't want to go on for too long because Jim's got some questions for me and I want to hear what you have to say. But, and I know that in America, we can't do things like mandating national service. But I sure would love to see a system where we rewarded it, where you couldn't go to graduate school in law or medicine or business if you didn't do some national service first. Um, and, uh, and where you might get benefits like, like scholarships. And I, I would hope that it would be really rigorous that it would be things like Teach for America, which only goes for the, you know, the most elite students and into the poorest schools, but maybe we should expand that to all schools. Maybe we should, you should, maybe we should be finding ways that government is something that all of us do for a short period of our lives, rather than something we pay other people to do, so that we all really have a stake in it again, so that we're all really citizens again. Um, and so my advice to those of you who want to become journalists is don't, at least not at first. Go serve somewhere for a few years. Or even travel somewhere for a few years. Every last one of you should have a passport by the time you graduate from this august institution and you should use it and see what the rest of the world is like and find something to do in it. Because that's gonna make you a better generation than my generation has been. I have tremendous, I have kids your age, I have tremendous faith in you because of what I've seen in my own kids and what I've seen in these young people who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I would like to quote, I'd close with a quote from one of my favorite philosophers uh, from Perth Amboy, New Jersey, Bruce Springsteen, um, who once wrote a lyric that I think is entirely appropriate to this. We've got to start saving up for the things that money can't buy. And with that, Jim, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, I think Joe didn't disappoint, <coughs> especially in the sense, <coughs> excuse me, of not being predictable. <laughs> uh, and that is an, an interesting and important message. I want to ask you, given what you've said, what was going on politically this year? The press basically said this was going to be a very close election. It turned out to be not that close. Uh, why wasn't it as close as people... Well, I mean, given all the traditional things you and I know about politics, uh, Barack Obama should have been in trouble, and he wasn't, as it turned out. Why? Uh, well, he wasn't in trouble for a couple of reasons. Um, one, he was running against a mortally lousy candidate. I mean, Mitt Romney, you know, time, his, his, dad, his dad was wiped out of the presidency because he said that he'd been brain, brainwashed by the generals of Vietnam. Um, and uh, that was actually a bit of truth telling. Uh, but Mitt grew up his entire life not wanting to make a mistake like that. And he would make a mistake like that every five minutes. I mean, you know, the 47% and, and uh, how he liked to fire people. I realized that that was kind of a gaffe and I knew he was making a larger point, but you just don't go around saying that sort of stuff. The other thing is this. Um, and I think if the, that you know the the election wasn't all that different from the way the polls were looking uh, toward the end, but you had one party, the Republican Party, that was living in a fantasy land. You know, um, it started. You know, the, the 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 beginning. Well, the beginning is that is that you have people who live in a hermetically sealed world that is bordered by um, the land of Limbaugh and the land of Fox News. And, um, uh, and, and they don't, and, and, and those, both, and, and that land has become a place of wishful thinking. Um, and, um, and so 
that infected the way Republic, the Republican primaries went. Um, they thought they could get away with insulting all the Latinos in the country about immigration. Mitt Romney, who was supposedly a moderate, never once stood to the left of his opponents. He even went to the right of Rick Santorum when it, comes, when it came to contraception. I mean, when Bill Clinton ran as a moderate, he gave something to moderate conservatives, not just to the base of his party, which was the promise of welfare reform. If you're going to be a moderate, you've got to actually be a moderate. And you'll notice that when Mitt Romney became a moderate in the last few weeks of the campaign, um, he started making it a race for a little bit. But, you know, the Clint Eastwood moment at the, at the Republican convention was deeply symbolic. He was having a conversation with an imaginary president. And then a few, d few weeks later, Mitt Romney makes this, uh, this rem these remarks about 47% of the people being, you know, takers and dependent and irresponsible. And he was talking about an, an imaginary electorate. And the real electorate showed up on, uh, on uh, election day. And they showed up in numbers that I think a lot of us didn't expect. And it spoke to the technical expertise of, uh, of the Obama campaign. But it also spoke to the fact that this is now a different America. It is not a country where a white, rural, regional party can win. And that's why so I think it happened in, the way it in, did. In that sense, is this a transforming election, uh, an election that will tr affect our politics for a generation or two generations? Well, I think it's going to affect it in terms of um, how the Republican Party, if it survives, um, addresses you know, the various constituencies in this country. I think that you're going to see that this year, Republicans are not going to block immigration reform. Um, they're going to have to deal with Latinos. As, uh, in fact, I think George W. Bush, you remember him, um, is going to make that a campaign this year, and is certainly his brother Jeb, who's fluent in Spanish. Uh, I, I think that they will have to make other adjustments as well. Okay. Uh, what about the younger generation of people you were talking to today and their involvement in, in the election. It was interesting to me that the one group, uh, age group, that voted in higher numbers uh, in 2012 and 2008 were the 18 to 29 year olds. Well, what, what does that mean? You know, it's interesting. We're talking about the, uh, the 48 hours that you guys couldn't um, experience the media at the beginning of, uh, of, of this course. Um, and I would suspect that a lot of the conversation in this generation is going on on Facebook and other places like that. And I think that the, you probably got the sense that there were a bunch of fools in Washington who were making decisions or more accurately not making decisions that were going to affect the, re the rest of your lives. And it's true. There are big decisions to be made. And so you had a lot of stake in this election. And that's why I think you came out. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about, go back a little bit, how you got into journalism. Why, what were you attracted to about journalism? Well, I, you know, I came in I started in 1969, and um, I was, you know, very much moved and shaped by three things. Uh, the uh, apparent idealism of John Kennedy, um, the civil rights movement, and, uh, and uh, the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam movement. and. Um, I wanted to find a way to be part of that conversation. And journalism seemed to me to be the way to, to do it. And I did, I started off in, you know, pretty traditional small town journalism, you know, compiling the police blotter for Beverly Mass, uh, covering the city council in Peabody Mass. 
um, but quickly switched over to the dark side, or what seemed to me like the fun side at the time, and became part of the underground press in Boston. And then I went to work for Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, and what I found was that, and what really attracted me to journalism, was the ability to keep on learning stuff. Um, and it was also that a lot of the preconceptions that I, I went into because of the politics I brought to the table proved to be um, insufficient and, and often inaccurate when I actually got to go out there and report. And for me, the most fun part of the job, the reason why I like going on these road trips rather than sitting around Washington listening to these people lie to me, um, is that I can't predict what folks on the road are going to say. You know, I can't, I, I have to go to a place like Afghanistan and Iraq to make my judgments about whether these are, you know, about what's going on there, because I'm not smart enough to do it just sitting in, in my armchair and stroking my chin. Um, and so the appeal of journalism, you know, that became an addiction, an addiction that hasn't yet abated, um, has always been the ability, uh, the possibility of hearing something you haven't ever thought about before, meeting someone who is incredibly compelling, who has a life story. Um, you know, you look at any given person on the street in Iowa, place where I've spent an, uh, an inordinate amount of time over the years, um, and you start talking to them about their lives, and damn if they're not gonna tell you something that you didn't expect. Um, and start you thinking in a different way. And the insights I gained from them and the insights I gained from overseas, I bring back to Washington and challenge the president and the other politicians with when I get to talk to them. You know, uh, in many ways, though, the type of journalism you've been able to practice has had a cause, a reason, it's something you believe in something you wanted to accomplish. Does that pose a problem for a journalist? In other words, this, we talk in news literacy about the separation between news and opinion. Uh, you're somebody who has crossed the divide. I say that uh, people who write opinion journalism, which I did for 20 years, have a 007 license to kill, in essence. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have a responsibility re to report, which a lot of a great many opinion columnists don't do. I mean, you know, we've had this, I mean, opinions are fun. People would rather read them than actually read news. And, um, and I think that we've really um, gotten to the point where there are a lot of people, many of them bloggers, although not all bloggers are like this, are just spewing opinions on the basis of nothing. Um, you know, you have institutions like Fox News and, and often MSNBC, I must say, um, that, I mean, take the, the recent case of uh, the situation in, ben in Benghazi. Um, that was a completely trumped up, phony political controversy. Completely. I mean, I have many sources in the State Department, and I have a son who is in the State Department who is friends with Chris Stevens, the ambassador who was murdered there. Um, and, you know, all of the, the, the facts of the case are known and they are not in doubt the way Fox News and senators like John McCain have made them out to be. I mean, you know, Jim, to get to your, the, the heart of your question, through most of our, the history of our country, journalism has been opinion journalism. Uh, for a brief shining moment, we had the illusion of objectivity. Um, but even now, um, as we in the mainstream media have sought to diversify ourselves and get various perspectives among our reporters, I, I'll sit down at the editorial table on, uh, on Monday morning in Time Magazine, and I'll be sitting with... Um, Ivy League educated white people, men and women, blacks, Latinos, Asians, 
South Asians, people with disabilities, gay, um, uh, both lesbians and, and homosexuals. Um, and we'll feel pretty proud of ourselves for being really diverse and having a really cover the waterfront. But what's missing from that picture? There isn't anybody who sits at our table who's a member of the Tea Party or who's an evangelical. And I think that that's, if we're going to reunite this country, we have to realize that they have a legitimate beef when it comes to that. Um, and that's why so many of them migrate to the fantasies that, uh, that Fox News is peddling. Actually, you bring up an interesting point. A number of people have, made, have said that one of the problems that the Republicans and the right wing have had is that they all wound up talking to each other in Fox News. Right. And there's been a concern on the part of mainstream journalists that Fox News was becoming too influential. Do you think this is a potential turning point in which the right is going to realize it has to reach out beyond just talking to itself in kind of a bubble? Well, I think that there are a number of people um, uh, in the Republican Party, I call it the Sanity Caucus, um, who, who understand that, that that's become the case. But I got to say to you, Fox News' influence reached well beyond the people on the right. It influenced the debate in, the, in Washington. I mean, we have had, because of you know, the insistence of Fox News, we have had a completely um, ridiculous overhyping of the long-term deficit as a problem. It's a problem, it's not a crisis. We have to deal with it because I got news for you. I'm gonna to live to 137 and you guys are gonna pay for it. Um, and, and there are real reforms that we can, we can move toward in terms of healthcare that will give us a better, better healthcare system at a, at a lower price. But the fact that at a moment when we were in the most severe recession since the Great Depression, the conversation in Washington was about long-term deficit spending rather than short-term immediate job creation was a tribute to Fox News. Um, so, you know, I think that, that, that there are good, some Republicans are going to wise up, but I, there was a very depressing, we were talking about this at dinner, there was a very depressing thing that happened um, this week, and that was the Senate refused to ratify the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Disabled. Now, for those of you who haven't followed this, that treaty was paid tribute to our Americans with Disability Act from 20 years ago. It was a suggestion to the rest of the world that they adopt the standards that we've adopted for people who have disabilities to make them full citizens and full participants in a society. 38 Republicans voted against it because it had words like the, the words United Nations in front of it. And they believe that anything to do with the United Nations is a threat to the sovereignty of this country. Now, among those 38 Republicans, I'll name three. Um, Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, one of the most moderate and thoughtful people I know voted against it. Um, Saxby Chambliss from Virginia, who has been part of the bipartisan effort to make a budget deal, who's one of the few Republicans who has acknowledged that we have to raise, um, that, that uh, we have to raise taxes, voted against it. Lindsey Graham, who sometimes goes off the deep end when he's siding with John McCain about going to war um, anywhere, everywhere, um, but has been reasonable about climate change and about raising revenues and a bunch of other things, voted against it. What do those three people have in common? They each will be facing a Tea Party challenge in 2014, a challenge from their right. And so, you know, when you ask whether the Republicans have learned anything out of this, I think some have. And, uh, and I think we'll see the effects and when it comes to the immigration vote. But I think that the party is going to have to exorcise its demons, maybe through another electoral cycle or two. Okay. Before we get to the questions from the audience, 
There's one question I've always wanted to ask you. We've had a long friendship, uh, but we've never talked about why did you write primary colors with a byline of anonymous? Was it, was it, did you realize it would make it a bigger seller since everybody was guessing who the heck wrote this book? Well, it was cowardice and whimsy, actually. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, every journalist thinks that he or she is a novelist just waiting to burst forward into the world with great success. And I didn't have any such illusions, but all of a sudden a scene took, I was at our mutual friend Elaine K. Mark's house at one, one night, we were having dinner and she said of the Clintons, these people are a novel. And then I started thinking about the narrator, who was a combination of me, George Stephanopoulos, and uh, black guy Bill Martin, who worked for um, Ron Brown, um, who sadly was killed in the plane crash that killed Ron Brown. Um, and he had a voice, he started talking, and I didn't know what he was gonna say next. And um, so my original thought was, the, the whimsy part of it is that my wife and I are big fans of 19th century English literature. And most of those books were written anonymously. Jane Austen never put her name on Pride and Prejudice. It was Pride and Prejudice by a lady. Um, and I thought that would be fun. Um, <laughs> but the cowardice part was I didn't know that I could do it yet. So I, I wrote and I got four chapters done and um, my agent took it to Random House and they said, wow, this is really kind of amazing. And at that point, things were happening that I couldn't predict at all. All of a sudden, a six-foot lesbian became the heroine of the book. Um, and, and when my wife would, wife would read her hilarious dialogue, she'd say, Joe, where on earth is this coming from? And I didn't know. And I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I, you know, at one point, I said to, years later, I said to Bill Clinton, you know, the gimmick in the book was that Jack Stanton, the main character, was going to lose but he just wouldn't. I would throw everything at him, and he kept on figuring out ways to get past it. So I said to myself, wow, there's something happening here, but if I put my name on this, it's gonna be judged as my, a statement on my relationship with Bill Clinton, and I want this to be judged as a novel to see whether people think it's any good. Um, and, uh, and so that's why it was done anonymously. And by the way, no one expect, I'm, you know, my boss, I, I, part of the, the deal was I had to tell my boss at Newsweek, which was where I was working at the time, he had to tell him about any freelance project, and I told him about this, and he read it months before it was published, and he said to me, Joe, this is really funny. This is a really funny book. He said, but you know, books like this never sell. And, um, and in fact, Random House was lowering the printing week by week, uh, and all of a sudden, it hit like a bomb. I was completely shell-shocked by it, and so was my wife, and kind of terrified. Uh, all of a sudden, they had nine printing plants printing over a million copies, which sold in this country. Um, and, um, and everybody included, and the President of the United States had tasked the press corps with finding out who wrote the damn thing. Um, and, if, and I'll tell you something, there's a, lesson, there's a journalistic lesson here. When I finally was outed, I had a press conference and I faced my colleagues, people, many of them people I'd known for years. And they were a screaming, ravening, half-crazed pack of imbeciles. And, <laughs> and they were trying, at that point, they were trying to drive me out of the business because they saw this novel as an act of journalism, which it wasn't. And by the way, there were no secrets in it. There were, I hadn't, didn't reveal any inside information. I had made a, every line of dialogue in the book was made up. Um, and that night, I was sitting, I, they'd flown me down from the Cape, and I was at the Waldorf, and I couldn't go to sleep, and I couldn't eat, and my hands were shaking, and I was drinking water constantly, going to the bathroom, drinking water, going to the bathroom, and I had this insight. I said to myself, Joe, what you've just experienced is an average day in the life of Bill Clinton. <laughs> And over the Not next, quite. <laughs> over, in, 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 over the next few weeks, um, I began to get phone calls from politicians. They had absolutely no ideological um, coherence. Newt Gingrich called from the right. The late Paul Wellstone called from the left. 
there are others along the spectrum. And they all had John McCain called. And they all said the same thing. We know what you're going through now. You feel as if you're never going to recover from this because the assault was pretty intense. And uh, because but, people felt that you had misled them. Because the because because the other journalists were trying to find a rationale for their jealousy, I think. <laughs> um, but you know they thought it was an act of journalism and that I had lied about it. Um, and uh, and they said, just go ahead and do your work. This will go away. And by the way. That pretty accurately caught what being a politician is like. And if you ever want to talk about stuff, if you ever need a source, give us a call. Because we now know that you can keep a secret. <laughs> um, and what I did, what it caused me to do, was to change my ground rules for interviewing politicians. I firmly believe that we as journalists have gone way too far, way too far in terms of the harshness with which we treat politicians. The biggest change in my life as a journalist over 40 years has been our movement from skepticism, which should be our natural state, to cynicism. It's reached the point where the hardest piece for a young journalist to write is a positive piece about a politician. I have an aphorism about cynicism. Cynicism is what passes for insight among the mediocre. And so what I did was I instituted a new rule, which I inform politicians of every time I sit down with them for the first time. It's a no gotcha rule. If you say something that is stupid and you recognize it as stupid and it doesn't involve a matter of high policy or national security, you can, make, you can take it back. I'm not going to sandbag you. I'm interested in the substance of what I'm writing about. I am not interested in getting you uh, because you, you said something dumb. And by the way, what I found is that that guarantee enables them to open up a little bit more than they might normally have. have. So that's the story of primary colors, and it's why it made me a better journalist. Interesting. Interesting. Let's go on to questions from the audience. I think we have a microphone over here. Just go over to the microphone. Or we'll bring a microphone to you. Marcy, you want to take someone out? Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Um, my name's Mike. I'm, Mom, my name is Mike. I'm a senior and a journalism major. And um, I just—you kind of touched on this, but how um, how is writing fiction for you? Oh, you have Yeah. Um, how, what really Why don't drew you hold the microphone straight into your mouth? <laughs> what drew you to writing fiction? You kind of touched on this, but what drew you to writing fiction, and how do you feel, what do you feel are the advantages of fiction over straight journalism? I, I think it's from where we're sitting. Mm -hmm. Good question. The, advan the advantages of fiction over straight journalism, um, you know, Journalism, you, do, you deal with actual facts and actual truths. Um, fiction, you deal with metaphoric and uh, symbolic truths and, and emotional truths. It's much easier to get at the emotional essence of the situation of a politician um, when you write fiction than it is when you write nonfiction. Uh, it's much easier when you write nonfiction, when you do journalism, to get at the essence of a policy question. Do you, do you think Hillary will run in 2016? Yeah, I do. Do you think she would make a good president? I, I think that she is probably the, I mean, I've watched this woman. Um, we've known each other for over 25 years now. And I've watched her learn and grow and learn and grow and to continually to have that capacity to learn and grow. During the years after 9-11, when I was trying to learn the military, she had joined the Armed Services Committee, and she was trying to learn the military. And I was telling the story before. 
uh, when I was out at Fort Leavenworth with General Petraeus, and he was having his one margarita a night, um, I asked him, is there any Democrat who might be president who has even the vaguest idea of how your mind works? And he said to me, you mean aside from Hillary? <laughs> and um, up until a few weeks ago, I kind of harbored the fantasy that we would have a uh, Clinton Petraeus ticket in 2016, but uh, I don't think that that's probably gonna be possible now. Um, she is a remarkably solid person. And by the way, let me extrapolate a bit and say this. Um, I am a femophile. I think women are innately superior and they're proving it. Probably more women who graduate from Stony Brook at the end of this year than men, right? Greater percentage of class will be women. Yeah. Um, I think women write bre better. One of the greatest compliments I was paid uh, for primary colors was that the editor who, to whom I was anonymous thought I was a woman. Um, uh, I think they, they're, they're really good singers and songwriters. Um, they, we've learned in terms of trade negotiations that they are much better negotiators than men. And I think that because they're where the family physically starts, they have a much more, they don't suffer from testosterone poisoning, number one. And number two, they have a much more profound sense of the value of life and are much less likely to get us into massive bloody stupidities like the war in Iraq. So I look forward to a generation of women presidents. I hope at some point we're gonna have, a, have to have affirmative action to get a male president back. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Shumil from, I write for the Minaret here in Stony Brook. Um, former President Jimmy Carter said that isolating uh, enemy states is counterproductive to solving the conflicts with them. Uh, what are your opinions on the Iran sanctions? Well, it, it depends on, you know, the question of isolating enemy states depends on the state and whether they're actually enemies. Um, I usually think that it's, uh, it's better to talk than not to talk. Um, let's take Iran as an example. Iran's, I've been to several times, and um, I don't know, how many of you have seen the movie Argo? You should, it's really good. It's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of fun. But um, the U.S. Embassy, where the hostages were held in 1979, is now the Museum of the Great Satan in, uh, in Tehran. And they have official graffiti on it. And my favorite piece of graffiti on it, or graffito, um, said, on the day the Great Satan praises us, we shall mourn. And I said to myself when I saw that, now there's a creative foreign policy. We should say, hey, we recognize you guys. You know, send us your, your pistachios and your rugs and anything else you want, and your oil, and we'll send you stuff too. Because that government would refuse it. Because they need to have the kind, uh, they need a great Satan to hold the power in that country. Now, I believe that the sanctions that we've imposed on them over the past year uh, and the isolation that we've imposed on them is going to lead us to a, a, a nuclear deal. Um, and, uh, and so, and it also may, you know, it's, it, it's hurting them very badly economically now, but the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the most powerful force in the country, and controls 30 to 40 percent of the economy, I think is putting some pressure on the supreme leader who, uh, if it were left up to him, there would be no deal. And so that's one of the things, you can't be optimistic about relations with the Islamic Republic after the last 30 years of our trying, um, but I'm not entirely pessimistic right now. In most other cases, though, I would rather recognize and talk than isolate. Can you talk a little bit about <coughs> the background, the history, and the circumstances of the fiscal cliff that we're facing now, um, who the characters were that uh, created it uh, back, I think, about 10, 12 years ago, um, 
what gave rise to it and, and uh, what, if anything, we've learned from it? Well, the fis fiscal cliff is a manufactured crisis. Um, and it comes from an overhyping of the long-term de deficit problem that we have into a crisis. And there's a guy by the name of Pete Peterson who is very, very successful on Wall Street, who, made, who has spent $500 million um, on institutions and advertising um, to hype this deficit crisis. And I think that And I think that these are issues that we have to, have to deal with eventually, if only for the benefit of the students here so that they don't have to pay so much for my retirement when I'm 137. Um, but it was used as a political issue by Republicans. George W. Bush inherited, inherited a balanced budget, indeed a budget in surplus. And he wiped that out via tax cuts, wars, and Medicare Part D, prescription drugs, a $500 billion unfunded um, mandate. And lo and behold, all the Republicans who voted for those wars and tax cuts um, and Medicare Part D are the very people who began screaming about government spending as soon as Barack Obama came into office. And as I said before, I fault the president for allowing Fox News to set this agenda. But I also think the following about the fiscal cliff. I don't care about it. I really don't. You know, let, let my colleagues in Washington, who are mostly horse race reporters, move from the horse race of the presidential campaign to the horse race of the fiscal cliff. Um, say we jump off of it. Say tax rates go back to where they were during the Clinton years. I remember when those tax rates were passed in 1993. We were in a recession. There were all kinds of conservatives who said we were going to move from a recession to a depression. The economy was going to collapse because tax rates were going up. And what happened? We went into a boom. Um, we went into an economic boom. The economy is too complicated to be swayed by a move of one or two or three points in marginal tax rates. So I don't want to see taxes rise on the working poor or the middle class, um, but it ain't the worst thing. It ain't going to be the worst thing in the world if it happens. The other components of the f fiscal cliff are that we would have to cut $500 billion additionally over 10 years in Pentagon spending. We already spend more than the next 15 countries in the world combined um, on, on defense. I think we're still buying, you know, Cold War era uh, armaments that we don't need at all. That's not going to trouble me. Um, the part that does trouble me is the $500 and uh, 500 $500, <laughs> the $500 billion in domestic policy cuts that are going to happen. And, if, and I think that if you, you might be able to get a fair amount of that if you, did, if you acted wisely. I mean, Mid, one of the points that Ms. Mitt Romney made that I agreed with was that there were 47 job training programs that the federal government runs. And by the way, they all suck. Um, there are better ways to do it. Uh, but you could go through the government. One of the things that has disappointed me about Obama is that, and this is a special responsibility for Dems, that if you actually believe in government, which Democrats do, you have to make sure that it runs efficiently in order to have credibility with the American people. And so that part of it bothers me the most, but I think we can survive jumping off the fiscal cliff. I hope, as this plays out, though, It'll put pressure on us to rethink all of our health care systems um, and figure out new, this is what I wrote about this week, new ways to make Medicare and Obamacare, which actually overlap, um, more efficient and, and, uh, and more interchangeable. And it may mean we'll be able to raise the age of Medicare uh, eligibility uh, for some and, uh, and save some money. So, just let me add to that question. 
why does the press almost unanimously accept the, the apocalyptic vision of what the cliff means? We see very little dissenting view. Because um, we need a story. I mean, really. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd prefer that we don't go off the fiscal cliff. Um, I, you know, I suspect that what will happen will be that we'll get past January 1st and, uh, and all of a sudden the, you know, the Clinton tax rates will, will, will be the law of the land once more and then Republicans will be able to vote to lower those tax rates for everybody but the wealthy and they'll be able to adhere to Grover Norquist's pledge and say that they voted to cut taxes when they run for re-election in 2014. It's a phony game. And too often the objectivity that you and I, that, that you asked me about before, has provided camouflage for baloney. It is, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not considered proper for a mainstream journalist, except for someone like me, you know, um, who's, who gets paid for opinions, <coughs> to say, this is phony. Or to say about Benghazi, this is, this is cruel and a waste of time. There are other things that we have to talk about. Um, that objectivity is too often a, uh, a fig leaf for cowardice. Um, and so, and also for just going along and getting along. Dean, we have time for two more questions? Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I have a question from the Obama-McCain uh, elections. There are a lot of cases where a lot of the ballots were withdrawn. Do you think this is just a mistake, or do you think this will be an increasing, um, I guess, occurrence in the future elections? Where the ballots were withdrawn? Yes. I just haven't followed that all that much. You know, I, I can't give you a, a smart answer about it. Hi, my name is Morgan. Um, this is a little off topic, but you've met a lot of interesting people over the years. When you worked for Rolling Stone, your boss, Richard Goodwin, when he invited you to join him um, at the Ethel Kennedy's house. You, you've uh, done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to interact with Hunter Thompson? What was it like to be what? What was it like to interact with Hunter Thompson? Okay, well, here's, uh, I'll tell you the story. Um, I, it was uh, the summer of Richard Nixon's impeachment, 1974, and I showed up. I was just given an address. I wasn't told where I was going. I was given an address in Virginia. I landed at um, uh, National Airport in Washington with two suitcases, which were all my possessions in the world. I was 28 years old. And um, we drive up to this mansion, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it is, um, and, and the cab driver says, this is the Kennedy House. You one of them? And um, I was shocked. We were at Ethel Kennedy. We were at Hickory Hill at the Kennedy's house. So that's July second. Um, and this maid trundles out, grabs my suitcases, and said, "Mr. Goodwin is waiting for you down by the pool." So I go down to the pool, and there's Goodwin, smoking a cigar and treading water in the pool. And he says to me, Joe, I want you to spend the summer. The House Ways and Means Committee is drawing up a new tax reform bill, and I want you to spend the summer watching that process and writing about it. I said, tax reform for Rolling Stone? I said, you think that I'll ever get in the magazine? He said, I don't care. You'll learn a lot. And I said, but anyways, the impeachment, I want to write about that. He said, Hunter's coming tomorrow. He will do it. That's what he's here for. So Hunter shows up on July 3rd. Um, much of that weekend remains shrouded in the mists of history for me. Um, I do recall that at one point there was a jukebox down by the pool, and um, it was filled with, uh, Ethel Kennedy at that point was dating the crooner, the singer Andy Williams, and the jukebox was filled with Andy Williams 45s. 45s were these little records with big holes in them. <laughs> they existed before you were born. And I do remember going to the Tyson Square Mall with Hunter and replacing all of the Andy Williams with Otis Redding and other soul musicians. Um, and 
The other thing I remember is that we were hatching plans to collect, to rent a, 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 um, a truck and, uh, and fill it with rats and dump the rats on the White House lawn. Um, but I also remember that we had very long and wonderful conversations, not just that weekend, but during the rest of our time knowing each other, about literature. That weekend, we had a really long and wonderful conversation about Joseph Conrad. And I got to say that Hunter faced a choice that some of you may face, and a number of people I know have faced. At that point, he had written Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. He was going to, he was going to be known a hundred years from then, and he will be, as a singular voice of that moment in time. And he figured that that, you know, that, that game was over, and he had to figure out what he wanted to do next. And I said, Hunter, why don't you get serious about fiction? You can do it. He said, I would have to be sober, and if I don't have this satchel, he lifted up his famous satchel, I have the mind of a second-rate accountant. And what he did instead was that he found that he could be paid big bucks going around from college campus to college campus, giving speeches, and just becoming the <coughs> celebrity Hunter Thompson. And he wrote a couple of good things during the rest of his life, but not very many. And it's a choice that I've seen too many people make in my business now that there, there's a lot of money to be made as a journalistic celebrity. Um, I think that we've lost some really good minds. Uh, Charles Krauthammer used to be a wonderfully nuanced columnist who was unpredictable and now he's a right-wing hat because he gets paid a lot of money to go around the country give speeches and to spout off on Fox News so that was a tragedy to me because I really loved Hunter he was he was great fun to hang around with one more question one more. Hi, my name is uh, Craig Brown. I teach American history and government. I have my high school students with me. And I was just curious, in the years of journalism, who is the best Republican president you covered and the best Democratic president you've covered? Um, the best Republican president that I covered was George H.W. Bush. Um, I thought that, you know, and, I, and I've come to that appreciation really over time. And, and, it, and it's because the things that he did were subtle, um, but they were really significant. And the one story I would tell was that when the Soviet empire collapsed and the wall came down in Berlin and people were dancing on the wall and knocking it down, um, Bush's advisors came to him and said, why don't you go there and give a speech? Um, because Reagan had famously gone to the, the wall and given a speech, and it would be great TV, people will love you for it, and Bush refused to do it. He said, I don't want to grind the Soviets, and the Russians' nose in this. We have business to transact. We want to re reunite Germany. And reunite Germany he did. Uh, I really appreciate his realism. I really appreciate the fact that he passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, that he passed the Clean Air Act, that he enacted the first cap and trade system um, for, uh, for sulfur dioxide. Um, and um, he was replaced by the best Democratic president that I covered, um, even though you know, he didn't face the crises that Barack Obama faced. And, I think the jury's still out on Obama. He's been a good president, but he could be an even better one. Um, but Clinton, very quietly, um, and, and by the way, this is a kind of interesting thing that I've just figured out for myself. It's the quiet parts of both these presidencies, the Bush and Clinton presidencies, that I most appreciate. Quietly, 
Bill Clinton was the best president in American history for the working poor. He made the vow that if you held a job, even in minimum wages, even if you were working at McDonald's, you were not going to live below the poverty line. And so he passed things like the earned income tax credit and daycare credits and other programs so that the, the, the value of working a minimum wage job increased 70% during the course of his presidency. Um, he was also a great politician who loved the game. And Jim quoted earlier um, from my column about Lincoln. Lincoln traded jobs for the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. He gave people, he made deals. And the one thing that I've learned over time, because every once in a while, in fact, far too often, we get these candidates for high office who say, I can deal with this because I'm an outsider, because I'm a businessman, or whatever, or I'm a general. Politicians make the best politicians. The people who appreciate and love finding the buttons to push, whether it's a job or a small you know, government deal or whatever, to get the votes that they need to move the country forward are the ones who are the great presidents. And they're the, they're the people that we should most appreciate. So the next time you see someone running for president as an outsider, just say no. Um, you want to have someone who is really experienced doing this because it is the most complicated and high pressure job in the history of the world. Joe, first rate job. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And don't forget, please, final word, please don't forget thinking about doing some form of service when you leave here, when you graduate from here, before you go on with the rest of your lives. 